So, yeah, my name's George Pepper, and I am the co-founder of Shift MS, which is a social network for people with MS. So thank you to, to the MS Academy, to the steering group, for inviting me to be part of today. And almost the perfect segue there to lead on to, to my talk, so thank you for that. Um, but I've been asked to bring a patient perspective on the discussion around the variances of MS care. So the level of variability has been kind of very well outlined this morning and also from the talks yesterday. Um, and we, we, we know the issues. Diagnosis takes too long. MS, um, there's not enough MS nurses, there's not enough MS neurologists. Access to allied healthcare professional ranges from limited in some centres to a rare sighting in others. MS teams are stretched, appointments are too infrequent. You know all this. And, uh, you know, we've talked about MRIs not being utilised enough. And, you know, from the disappointing news, the very disappointing news back in September, is a continual reminder that it's the people with progressive MS who are continuing to get the worst deal. And we should not forget that. So when I started preparing for this talk, I, I reached out to the Shift MS community and I asked them for their, their opinions on this subject. So although the variance in MS care was evident from, from their responses, so too was the number who reported receiving an excellent service. The value in MS nurses in particular shone through, as did the envy from some of our international members in parts of the, of the UK service. It's important that if, you have, have, if we were to have a discussion about how the services can be improved, we take the time to acknowledge the areas that are working well, at least in parts of the UK. So although I take the points from yesterday um, around you know, variance potentially being a different word for inequality, I personally don't think vari variance necessarily a, is, a, is necessarily a bad thing or an issue that could be realistically avoided. When you have specialist MS centres who are able to recruit you know, dedicated multidisciplinary teams, or you have MS centres with research teams at their core, you'd expect these services, you know, as someone living with MS, you'd expect to receive an improved service. I, I wonder whether it's, you know, well also I think we, we need, I believe that we need the, you know, the leading centres, the pioneering individuals, to be, those, to be the people who are leading the way in continual improvements to care. This innovation should be encouraged and celebrated from all sides. Perhaps the question we need to ask is how do we you know, support those, improve the services for those with lower performing centres, or for those who you know, are most in need of recruiting more specialist neurologists, more nurses, more scanners, etc. You know, one potential solution could be to spend more money and use these funds to recruit more staff, you know, whether it's new nurses, neurologists, you know, radiologists, scanners, etc. But I'm not sure how likely that is to happen. Um, I think we still need to put in the, kind of the economic arguments to why this should be the case. But today, I firstly want to talk about how we can better use the resources that are already available to us. So, as I said, I, I asked the shift community what they thought. I was now planning to, to show you a kind of stream of comments that in response to my forum posts and some of the emails and tweets that I'd received. But to bring this conversation to life, I decided to ask a few of these, a few of these responders if we could have a call to discuss. <laughs> Why do you think it's important that people with MS engage in their own healthcare? I think it's quite vital, actually. Um, I think with a condition like MS, which is already quite unpredictable, and you have a certain loss of control when it comes to things like relapses or um, new symptoms developing, those sorts of things, as your disease progresses, it's quite tricky to regain that control. And the only way to really do that is to feel like you're in partnership with your HCPs. I think that I'm the only person who knows what my symptoms are every day and what that feels like to me and means to me in my life. I don't think it's helpful for anybody to just mentally sweep it under the carpet. They need to engage because that's what's going to help them get better and fight it and become a better more capable individual. So how do you think neurologists and MS nurses could empower MSs 
you know, particularly newly diagnosed MSs, to take a more active lead in the role of well, the management of their MS? I think it's really important to for, for HCPs to understand that they have to create a safe and open environment for people to have those discussions in. But also to have confidence in me while I don't have that confidence. Patients should be pointed to online resources, including Shift MS, for understanding better the symptoms, the, the various treatment options they have. I think a huge difference was if there was some sort of uh, structure, almost a protocol for dealing with patients to deliver them the diagnosis and then help them with the next step. What role do you think technology could play in the monitoring or the management of MS? Things like apps and I have a smartwatch and I use them to record and maintain good habits as well. They sort of remind me to do things, remind me to take medication. There's mobile apps already that can send reminders about medication, help the patient log when they have taken medication. We all now get a text message when we have a doctor's appointment. Well, I do for my GP surgery. So if you had a text message, if you're new to it, reminding you to take your medication. The ideal would be to have an app that would allow you to have graphs or something. So you can go to your appointments and say, OK, Nero, you've got your EDSS scale, but actually here's my fatigue that's happened over the last 12 months since I saw you. There's a gap between the MS experts and the MSers communities. And I, I think the value of MS reporters is to reach this gap between these two communities. What advice would you give to MSers who are not receiving the access to the disease modifying treatments they would like to be on or, th or think they should be on or perhaps receiving the care that they feel they need? I think, um, as you know, I'm quite passionate about self-advocacy and I think it's really um, important to do your research. I think if it's almost like presenting a business case. If you know what you're talking about and you know your, your, your condition, um, I think it's almost like saying, OK, so this is where I feel we are. I've heard about this. I'd really like it for X, Y and Z reasons. Um, could you please refer me or please could you can, can we consider this together? So perhaps one option would be just to ask, for instance, the GP potentially to refer them. One of the conversations to have with medics and nurses is, please can you help me understand why you have chosen not to do the following? So thank you to Dominic, Carla, Paul and Victoria for sharing your perspectives and to all the other MSs who contributed to the discussion. In following on from this video, I'd like to focus on patient engagement and use some time at the end of my talk to, to touch on the role of patient networks. So I, oh, sorry, I, have, I have little doubt that the most underutilised resource that's available to healthcare professionals is that of the patient themselves. There is strong evidence base, and it has been for some years, that those who engage with their own healthcare have better, have improved long-term outcomes, receive better care, and incur lower costs. Now, from the, the um, triple aim triangle that Charlie Davey touched on yesterday, I think they're pretty related to those three bullet points. So this, this point should not be sniffed at. Many MSs live with the condition for 40, 50 years plus. You know, MS is seriously is a long-term condition. And I believe there's opportunity to activate more patients to take an active role in the management of their MS than certainly is currently the case. I believe that high levels of patient engagement can help to level the playing field with the disparity of MS care in the UK. So you all know this better than I do, and I expect you have far more coherent ways of describing it, but not all patients are equal. As one of our members sum summarised it, some MSs will have the knowledge, the skills, the confidence to manage their own health, while others may be more passive. And it's this passive group, you know, could be described to be split into two areas. One with MSs who simply don't engage or ask questions from the healthcare professional. Perhaps this is through lack of confidence, or maybe they're going through a period of denial. And then there's those who expect everything to be done for them, you know, the type of people who, who aren't taking responsibility. So can we improve patients' activation? Well, in the King's Fund report that I kind of referenced in the previous slide, it talks about how you know, we, we can have interventions which can improve activation. I'd be very interested to learn from the people in this room about ways that you've attempted to improve your patients' activation. You know, would the cost of providing tailored intervention to MSs, 
with lower inter activation be outweighed by the long-term beneficial, well, long-term benefits of their improved health outcomes? I don't know, but perhaps it's something we could discuss further. I expect the MSs who are visiting the Shift.ms website, you know, the MS Trust, MS Society, or the Bart's MS blog, are already engaged to some extent. But it's the MSs who don't engage with these services, and this was touched on earlier. It's those who don't engage with these services I worry about the most. So how can we reach this group? Well, I'm sorry to do this, but I think that this responsibility might go back over to you. I believe there's a window opportunity, you know, particularly around diagnosis, and there's a comment earlier about how we can get, you know, reach the people who've fallen through the cracks, but how we can actually find, you know, find the opportunity when, when their people are diagnosed to, to speak to them, to understand what the activation level is like, and to understand whether there's interventions we can have. One MSer who responded to me a couple of weeks ago, well, they sent me an email, and they recounted a conversation that they'd had with their neurologist, who may or may not be within this room. I, I will not say. But this was back in 2003. And soon after the MSer's diagnosis, the neurologist said to them, I'm not telling you that you have a terminal illness. You have a chronic condition, and it's up to you to manage it. The email continued. From that point on, I started to take back control. I believe that this message is concise, direct, and empowering. This was 15 years ago, but I can't fault it. I would advise you to take a note. The MSO remembers the exact wording used. Please don't underestimate how a few choice words can have a lasting impact. For many of us, these early appointments following diagnosis, well, they stay with us. So engaging patients in their own healthcare has multiple benefits. Not only do patients improve their long-term health outcomes, but, but many go on to provide support to other MSs too. This is where the patient networks have a role in supporting not only the individuals, but the wider MS community. So do social networks have a part to play in influencing behavior change? Well, Dr. Madalina Zucala, who's the manager of behavioral science at Johnson Johnson, thinks so. She wrote a piece on UCL's DigiHub earlier this year. She says, there are certain studies suggesting that social networks have a role in reducing certain risk behaviors, such as smoking or alcohol consumption. Madalina goes on to say that recognizing that behavior can spread and cascade across social networks. Researchers are now focusing on how to leverage the effects of such networks to promote healthy behaviors. And finally, Madalina adds that while showing promise, research is still needed to hone the optimal strategies for initiating and maintaining health behavior, health behavior change by leveraging virtual social networks. So my, my takeaway from Madalina's article, and I you know, suggest you, you have a read, is that not only are social networks you know, connecting, and in, in connecting and informing people through lived experience, but there's also a possibility for deep impacts on influencing behavior. It's a space we're keeping a close eye on. So I hope by now you're all very familiar with this report. Brain Health Time Matters is probably the most widely endorsed report out there. I'm not sure if that's true, Gavin, maybe. Um, and it's been written on the you know, management of MS. The report outlines a number of evidence-based recommendations, you know, all with robust economic rationale behind them around the management of MS. The report was published over three years ago, but many of the recommendations are not being met. The UK, and we've heard about this yesterday afternoon, the UK is lagging behind many of our European counterparts in the adoption of many of these recommendations. I'm embarrassed when I see this on the league tables with the UK down in the relegation zone. Why is this? Ooh, sorry. The UK has one of the lowest prescribing rates of DMTs in comparison to other European countries. You know, in particular, the, the, the rate of prescribing of the more recent high efficacious treatments is low. Use of MRIs has been talked about in this meeting, but that is also low. And yeah, with us knowing that so much of an MS's disease activity is asymptomatic, 
that's a concern to me as a patient. I don't know why we wouldn't want to see under the lid to see what's actually happening to us. But why is this? Is it because neurologists are being slow in responding to latest evidence? Is eligibility restricting prescribing? Are the costs of monitoring and treatments too high? Probably. Are patients not demanding enough? Are we the ones who are ill-informed? You know, whatever the cause of the UK lagging behind, it's the people with MS who are, losing, who are losing, losing out. I say let's find a way to make best use of the tools that are available to us. So what can we do about this? Well, we need to speak up. We need to move things along. Patient networks have a responsibility to inform, patient, to inform their communities on the latest evidence. Patient networks have an opportunity to influence, to, camp, sorry, to use their influence to campaign for improved care. And I think patient networks and healthcare professionals, I believe there's an opportunity for us to work together to deliver a unified message to accelerate the adoption of improved care for MSs throughout the UK. And by hearing the message from all sides, it will become harder to ignore. I hope to have the opportunity to work with some of you in, in ways that we can make this happen. So finally, in summary, please do, do what we can to increase patient, activa act, increase patient activation. This needs your help to engage with some of the more passive MSs and perhaps those who have fallen through the cracks. Promote self-advocacy. I, mean, I think we should aspire for all people who've been diagnosed with a long-term condition to be their own self-advocate. And how can we leverage patient networks to demand change by, by utilising the power of community. Thank you very much for listening. We're running out of time, but we're going to steal back a bit from lunch. I hope you don't mind. One or two questions. Any questions for George? I mean, I think it's pretty clear one of the solutions to the problem is patient activation. John. Thanks, George. I wholeheartedly endorse that view that you need to engage patients in this. The most valuable resource in, ter in terms of generating useful data that we can um, quite quickly see how much patient engagement and you know, interventions make the difference. My only slight caveat, we've seen what's happened in the world of social media and people being nudged in the wrong direction. I mean, I think we all need to be aware of uh, making sure that there's responsible and appropriate information out there um, because you know, there have been a number of harmful interventions that have been done the rounds in MS over the, the years and, and so we do need to be wary of how the information gets uh, and, and you know, things we get ahead of steam for putting stents in your veins or whatever. So, sure. you know. no, it's, a, it's a really important point um, and I, I, I do agree. I, mean, I think the one thing we can use to counteract that is education, and by engaging people and educating them of, of, where, of, of how and where to find this information, hopefully that will kind of fight some of the, well, some of the campaigns that have happened over recent years. Yeah, so that, that's one of the reasons why I got into social media, John, is to, to be in the echo chamber to counteract the false, what I would call anti-science movements, I call them. Thank you for that. Um, I agree with, obviously, with a lot of what you were saying. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I suppose um, just thinking about the kind of rise of uh, digital technology in terms of helping self-management and so on, and there's a proliferation of apps in particular that can support people, but there isn't a whole lot of information out there about what we can trust, uh, what's actually going to be used in a consultation and, and so on with healthcare professionals. And I'm just wondering if you've got any thoughts about what we can do to, I suppose, uh, Make sure that what what is promoted, particularly in terms of apps, is responsible and it's you know trusted. Sure, well, I think there's a couple of points in that. Um, I mean, firstly, I think the more that, that patients, patient groups, and healthcare professionals can work together, the better. So we can you know, try and untease some of these issues. Um, Carla, who was one of the MSs on the video, um, in in the conversation we had, she talked about you know, the importance of tracking data, the graphs that are shown, and kind of wasn't in this particular film, but we talked about how that was received by healthcare professionals. And the problem is often there's just not the time for them to absorb that information and then to respond to it. So I think we need to really understand what's possible and to set expectations for both the MS themselves, but also the healthcare professional. So yeah, it's something we need to work on, but it, it feels to be a waste opportunity to not use technology in a far more effective way. Last question before coffee break. 
Agnes Rokin, consultant neurologist, Strawberry Hospital. Um, I probably would answer Georgina's question, if that's okay. There is a system which called Patient Knows Best. We have, we have an account and a license for that system, and our patients are um, able to record their symptoms. They can review their, their clinical letters. They can also um, have a communications between the healthcare providers. So perhaps maybe MS Shift could link with that company and work together. Sure. I think, yeah. This is a fantastic resource, but it comes at a price, and a lot of the NHS trusts are not prepared to put the money on the table to link up with the 